So today, we learned how to determine chemical quantities in a, in a reaction, otherwise known as stoichiometry. Now we're gonna carry that further into how to deal with solutions. And this is largely due to the fact that most chemistry of interest happens in solutions. In other words, you can have chemical reactions where gases are, are reactants. You can even have reactions where solids are reactants. Um, but, well, for gases, you can control the amount of reactants fairly easily. Um, but it's, it's chemical reactions that are of interest in the biological sciences in particular occur in aqueous solutions. So that's gonna be our focus for today. All right, and this is chapter 15 in your textbook. And these are the topics that we're gonna cover. So remember from our first, early in the semester, the discussion of mixtures. Um, homogeneous mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures. So you know the difference there. We identified homogeneous mixtures as solutions. Solutions are, are made up of two basic components. One is the solvent. The solvent is the major component. And there is always only one solid. You can have, let's see, how did that happen? There, okay. You can always have only one solid, but you can have many solutes. The solutes are the minor components. Right? And the sky is the limit. You can have many minor components as you want. So in this context, if we're interested in aqueous solutions, the aqueous, aqueous refers to the solvent, which is water. Okay. Now, just as a point of interest and uh, further explaining solutions, a homogeneous mixture or a solution can have uh, any mixture of phases. You can have uh, a gas and a gas mixed together or a gas and uh, lots of gases mixed together. Uh, air is a perfect example. So with air, you have uh, about 79% nitrogen gas and about 20% you know, I think that's wrong. I think it's 78%. 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen gas. Right? So nitrogen would be the solvent. And oxygen would be one of the solutes. But there are others in there. Uh, about 1% is argon. And then you have minor components, like water vapor, uh, carbon dioxide and various other gases. But that's a case where a solution is composed of gas solvent and gas solutes. Um, you can have liquids mixed with liquids. Uh, booze is a perfect example. You have water as the major component and um, alcohol or ethanol might be 
Um, well, if it's wine, it could be 15%. Alcohol by volume. And then, of course, the major component would be water. It'd be essentially the rest of it. Okay, so that's a liquid and a liquid solution. You can have solids and solids in solution. Brass is a perfect example. Right. Brass, yeah, let me fix that. Brass is a solution of copper and nickel, primarily. I don't remember the, the composition, but copper is the major component. Nickel is the minor component. So copper would be the solvent and nickel would be the solute. Of course, you can't get two chunks of solid copper and silver, I mean, copper and nickel, and push them together, it doesn't work that way. You have to melt them. And once they've been melted and mixed properly, allowed to solidify, now you have a solid solution. Um, carbonated water is an example where a gas is dissolved in a liquid. So water is the solvent and carbon dioxide is the solute. Um, pop is a perfect example of that. Uh, seawater. This is an example. Seawater, sugar water, salt water, whatever you want to call it, is what most people think of when they think of solutions. A solid dissolved in a liquid. <clears throat> and this is just one type of solution. You can dissolve uh, sodium chloride in water, like salt water, is uh, sodium chloride predominantly. There, there are many other solutes here. Sodium chloride solute, and it's roughly uh, three and a half percent um, mass man, uh, mass volume. No, mass mass. Excuse me. And of course, uh, the major component is water. So this is the solvent. Sugar solutions, you can make up almost, I mean, it's, you can put enough sugar into a sugar solution, a sugar water solution, that you exceed the amount that it will hold. But um, sugar is considered the solute, and the solvent is water. Okay, those are examples of solutions of made from different phases of matter. <clears throat> Here we go. Um, an interesting thing about ionic solutions, where the solute is a, an ionic compound. When it goes into solution, into aqueous solution, and we're limiting our discussion now to aqueous uh, solid uh, liquid solutions. What happens is when the sodium chloride goes into solution, right? we can write it that way, now it's in an aqueous solution. But what actually happens is the sodium chloride breaks up into individual ions. Right? And these ions become hydrated by water. The water molecules surround them and that's what draws them into solution. Okay, now how is it that water can do that? Well, water is a polar molecule. And if you look, if you could see individual molecules of water, they would look something like this. There's the oxygen bound to hydrogen atoms, okay? And it's not straight, it's bent. 
And if you could see the electrons, you'd find that there is a pair of electrons here and a pair of electrons there. Okay. So once you have this idea, this picture in your mind of the, uh, the water molecule, there's another concept called electronegativity. And it just means that some atoms, some elements, are stronger attraction, attractants for electrons than others. And in this case, we have a strong attraction for electrons to go this way. Now, they don't completely move from that atom to that atom. They only shift slightly. Right? They don't go so far as to make separate ions. But when they do that, now you shift the um, net charge on the molecule toward the oxygen. Right? And we use that small delta. That's a Greek letter delta with a negative sign to show that this is a slight negative charge on that side of the molecule. That leaves positive on this side and positive on that side. Okay, now you have an idea of what we call polarity. The molecule is polar. It has a positive pole and a negative pole. All right, in this case, negative pole, positive pole. So what it does is when you put that solid sodium chloride into uh, water, the water molecules attack the sodium ions by lining up like that, right? With this slight negative, so you get an attraction there. And they surround the sodium. They get as close to the sodium as possible. And then there are other water molecules out here right, that are doing that. And all of those forces combine. The one, the water molecules that are close to the sodium, and then the water molecules that are pulling on the water molecules that are inner to the sodium. And it supplies enough force to pull that ion away from the crystal. And when it does, then there's opportunity for other water molecules to surround the sodium. That's what we call, it's a process called hydration. Sodium is hydrated. The same thing happens with chlorine, only with chlorine, you get the other side of the molecule. Right? This is the positive end. There you go. And then the water molecules associate with the one that's closest to the chlorine, and they pull it out of the crystal. And they just keep doing that. Fresh surface is exposed each time you pull an ion away, and they keep going until it's all gone. <clears throat> this is what I meant uh, early on the semester with um, we are able to see, we are able to observe macroscopic changes, macroscopic activity. But the microscopic is where the business is actually happening. And if you can adjust your thinking so that you can think in terms of the microscopic, then the macroscopic makes more sense. Okay, um, this concept of polarity can be extended to other molecules. And in the example here, we have ethanol. Uh, we have two carbon atoms bound together, and then we have hydrogen atoms bound to one of the carbons, and then we have, let's see, yeah. And then we have, say, let's do it this way. Hydrogen here, hydrogen here. And then we have another oxygen there with a hydrogen there. And notice it's bent right here, just like it was for the water molecule. And we have these lone pair, we call them lone pair electrons. Okay, so at this end of the molecule, you can get 
a, uh, a polarity established in this region, right? So we have a shift of electron density here, so we get slight negative there and slight positive there. So for this molecule, the one end of the molecule is polar. We get this polarity on this end. This end is nonpolar, but this end is polar. And this is where when you put ethanol into solution to make an alcoholic beverage, it is hydrated on this end. And the, uh, the picture there shows you a water molecule approaching and how it orients itself to draw on the ethanol and pull it into solution. All right. That's why ethanol is soluble in water. What we're getting at now, we're moving toward one of the cardinal rules of thumb in chemistry. It's called like, like dissolves like. Okay, so if your solvent is polar and your solute has a polar component to it, then they're more likely to form a solution. If the solvent is nonpolar and the solute is polar, then they're less likely to form a solution. That's why oil and water don't mix. Oil is nonpolar, water is polar. Okay. Um, here's a um, here's the structure of sucrose, right? Table sugar. And um, you don't have to memorize this. Just notice that all around this molecule, you have OHs. There's an OH, there's an OH, there's an OH. Just like our ethanol molecule, these OHs are places where you can have polarity. Polarity there, polarity there. So those are places where the water molecule can attach to the sucrose. And that's why you can get so much sugar in the solution. You can put you can put enough sugar in solution eventually where the sucrose component is larger than the water component. But we don't shift and say that now sucrose is the solvent. It started out water was the solvent. And even no matter how much sucrose you put in there, we still consider water the solvent. All right. So there you have uh, the example of a nonpolar oil and a polar water refusing to mix. <laughs> they will not form a solution. Now, there's a term that uh, I missed earlier, hydrogen bonding. When you have an, an, an element that is a strong attractant for electrons, has a high electronegativity, like oxygen, or nitrogen, or fluorine, okay, in a molecule, then when you attach a hydrogen to it, you get a polarity shift toward that atom, okay? So now you have a polar bond. Well, the hydrogen bond is um, relatively strong as an interaction between molecules. For this reason, this electronegativity gives you a slight negative side there and a slight positive side there 
on in each case. The other nice thing about it is hydrogen is very, very small. It's only one proton. Well, for most isotopes, it's one proton. So other molecules can approach very close because this doesn't take up much space. And you can get um, on this side, you would have some um, some slight negative molecule over here, whatever that is, and you would get an attraction there. And this can, thing can move very close. This X can be very close. And one of the rules of attracting strength, both for electrostatics and for gravity, for that matter, or magnetism, the closer you are, the stronger the attraction. So if you get very close with this negative to that positive, you get a very strong bond. That's the nature of the hydrogen bond. Okay. So we're going to try to understand how solutions form. And let me let me turn the page in my hard copy so I All right. Um, this slide, while it does explain how solutions form, I think I need to elaborate on it um, and give you a better idea of what happens when a solution forms. It's divided into three steps. Right? First step, the solute breaks apart. Right? So if it's a solid, the, the atoms or molecules are very close together and there's strong attraction. So you have to put energy in to pull them apart. Right? So we, we have to add energy to get them apart. And that's called endothermic. Endo means into. We have to add heat or add energy to get those things broken apart. The second step is the solvent breaks apart. Now, that doesn't mean that the solvent just completely turns into a gas and goes flying off. <laughs> that means this concept of making a hole, that first statement in the slide, we make a hole. And that's one way of understanding but we're making a place for the solute to fit. Okay. And in order to do that, we have to pull these solid molecules apart. This is also an add energy, endothermic. Okay. Now, once you've got the solute apart, and once you've got the solvent apart to make a hole, then this one goes into the hole and you establish intermolecular interactions between the solvent and the solute. So in this case, the solute and solvent bond forms. When that happens, that is a lower energy state. When they come together and bond, that's a more stable, lower energy state. And that means they have to give up energy. So this one um, subtracts. Uh, that's, not, that's not a good word. This one, um, let's just say gives up gives up energy, and this is exothermic. Exo means out of, so it gives up energy. Now the balance among these, we put energy in to these two steps and we get energy back with the third step. The balance of those two determines whether the solution gets hot or gets cold 
when you try to make it, right? Uh, everybody's been to a hospital, I assume. Um, maybe you just had a sprained ankle and um, uh, you had an x-ray to see if it was broken. No, it's not broken, it's just sprained. So they put an ice pack on it. Now there are two ways you can do that. You can take a Ziploc bag and throw ice and water in there and slap it on the injury. Or you can get one of their cold packs and there's a capsule inside of a certain type of, of uh, compound. And it's surrounded by water in that pack. So you break it. You break that capsule and mix them together. And the heat of solution in that case would be you put energy in, but you don't get much back. So energy is being absorbed from the surroundings and that makes it cold. Now, if you've got a muscle sprain, um, your, your neck's tight as a uh, wound spring. You want to loosen it up. You can get another bag, break the capsule, and it gets hot. And you can put it on those muscles and it'll loosen them up. In that case, you put energy in, but you get a whole lot of energy back in the third step. That makes the overall process exothermic and it gives up heat. Okay, so I, I hope that explanation makes more sense than just make a hole. All right, and here's the concept of like dissolves like that I've already explained. All right, so here we have a, a test of what we have learned so far. And this concept check just uses our rule of thumb, like dissolves like. Choose the best answer. Assume all the components, compounds are in the liquid state, and we want to say which ones will dissolve and which ones will not dissolve, okay? How about carbon tetrachloride and water? And water. All right, we know water is polar. Right, that's given, that's polar. How about carbon tetrachloride? Well, if you don't know about carbon tetrachloride, you won't know, you don't know its structure, you won't know if it's polar or nonpolar. But this is nonpolar. And it's nonpolar because we got a carbon in the middle, we got a chlorine here, we got a chlorine here, we got a chlorine there, and then right in the back, we have another chlorine. So this forms a triangle on the base and up like that. It forms a regular structure, a regular geometric shape called a tetrahedron. Now, chlorine wants to do this thing. It wants to draw electron density away from the carbon, and all of the chlorines do. But their orientation is perfectly symmetrical. So this polar bond cancels that one and that one and that one, and they cancel each other. So the whole molecule is nonpolar. All right. So these will not mix. No solution. How about B? Ammonia mixed with water. Ammonia in water. Okay. Again, this one's polar. How about ammonia? Well, ammonia is a little bit different than carbon tetrachloride. Ammonia is like this. Right? It has a hydrogen in the back, has a hydrogen out here, and a hydrogen out here, and they form that, that triangle base. But up here is a lone pair of electrons. So we get the nitrogens drawing like this from each one of them. Plus, we have this negative charge up here with these lone pairs. So we get overall, we get a negative that end and a positive this end. Ammonia is a polar molecule. Right? 
So we get a solution. Ammonia will dissolve in water. How about the next one? CH3OH. In what? Oh, in water again. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's be consistent. All right. So this one, polar. How about this one? This one is like ethanol that we saw earlier. You have carbon. You have hydrogens here. Then you have an oxygen and a hydrogen. So you have a polar bond here. This forms a solution. Okay. And the last one, nitrogen in what? In methane. Okay. Uh, we can approach this one from two different directions. One, are they both polar or nonpolar? Well, methane is shaped like carbon tetrachloride. It's a regular tetrahedron. It is nonpolar. Okay. Nitrogen gas is like this. Right? Both these nitrogens are have equal attraction for electrons. Right? So nobody wins. The bonds are not polar. This is a nonpolar molecule. So you would expect this to form a solution of gases. The other approach is just to know, recognize, anytime you put two or more gases together, they always form a solution. Every time. It doesn't matter if they're polar or nonpolar. They always form a solution. The reason for that is that compared to solids and liquids, gas molecules are very far apart. The ex distance is extreme compared to the size of the molecules. They're way far apart. So there's, there's already lots of holes in there right, for everybody. So when you put two or more gases together, they always form a solution. It doesn't matter what their polarity is. Okay, so there we have three. We have one non-solution and one, and the rest of them form solutions. That's the one that does not dissolve. <clears throat> based on polarity. All right. Um, in many cases, we may reason it out that a substance will readily dissolve in water based upon polarity or based upon polarity and ionic nature. Right? If your substance breaks apart into ions, then we would expect that it would go into solution. There are competing forces in there the forces that break the substance apart or the forces that hold it together will determine whether or not the ionic compound will break apart and be available to hydrate. Right? We'll get to that one a little more in, in detail in a minute. The concept I want to introduce now is a uh, limit to solubility. And what we call that is saturation. If we reach the saturation point, then we can't put any more solute into solution, right? We can't make any more holes and the solute will not go into solution any further. It's saturated. Now, what does it look like when it's saturated? Well, it could be saturated and um, you don't see any undissolved solid, for instance, sitting on the bottom of your beaker. 
Um, or if you do see some sitting uh, solid on the bottom of the beaker, then you know that you've reached the saturation point. Um, if, if that's the case, if you have a beaker, say with, that's got, um, oh, I don't know, um, well, you can do it with sodium chloride. If you've got sodium chloride in solution here, then you've got a pile of sodium chloride down here, then you know at that temperature, your solution is saturated. Now, how would I make a saturated solution that didn't have any sodium chloride in the bottom of it? Well, I wait till it's stable and then filter it. Filter out the solid. Now you have a saturated solution and no solids there. And by the way, I mentioned it, but I want to hammer this point. Saturation, the point of saturation, is dependent upon temperature. Most solid solutes um, can be dissolved at higher amounts as the temperature increases. That's not the case for all of them, but most of them do. Anything below that level is unsaturated. Right? If we can put more solute into solution, then the solution technically is unsaturated. Now, a strange phenomenon occurs sometimes for some solutions, um, and we'll, we're going to confine our discussion to aqueous solutions. You can put a solid into an aqueous solution, go into solution, and if you heat it up and put more into it, that's okay. But then you set it on the, on the lab bench and let it sit there. Don't disturb it. Let it cool down. When it cools down to room temperature, if you saturated it at a higher temperature, now what's going to happen? Well, for many solids, as the temperature falls, excess solute drops out of solution as the solid. But if you don't disturb it, very often what will happen is you will um, decrease the temperature and all of that saturation from the higher temperature will still be there. In other words, it's super saturated. It's not supposed to hold that much at that temperature. So, um, another point is that these solutions, these super saturated solutions, are very unstable. So, if you disturb it in any way, I mean, if you shake it, you stir it, if you reach in with your spatula and scratch the inside of the beaker, that extra solute will drop out of solution pretty quick. All right, very unstable. All right, solutions are mixtures. The amount, which means the amount of solute dissolved in the solvent can vary. It can be variable amounts. Right? Because we have not changed the identity of the solute or the solvent in the process. No chemical reaction yet. Right? So you can put various amounts. As long as it's unsaturated, you can have various amounts of solute in the solvent. So we need a way to express what that is, that concentration. How do we do that? Well, of course, you can do it qualitatively. You can say if the solution is very concentrated, in other words, um, the amount of solute is approaching saturation, but not quite there yet. You can say it's concentrated. If there's just a tiny amount of uh, solute in the solvent, we can say it's dilute. Right? And we use those expressions all the time in the, in the laboratory setting, concentrated versus dilute. Um, when we talk about uh, the danger of certain acids, we may say that they're concentrated. 
So um, concentrated uh, hydrochloric acid, it could be 37% mass volume. That's concentrated hydrochloric acid. Um, we can have um, we can have acetic acid, and actually, you can have one hundred percent acetic acid. That's called glacial acetic acid, or you can have other lower concentrations, but they're still concentrated. This is the most concentrated you can get, right? 100%, you can't go above 100%. <clears throat> or you could have um, nitric acid, right? Um, I used to use nitric acid in the laboratory setting at 70%. Very dangerous, but it's concentrated. All right. So there are various ways to express the amount of solute in the solution. Mass percent is one that's very common. Mass percent. What does that mean? That means mass of solute. per mass of solution times 100, okay? That will give you mass percent. So we know that say, if it's 10, 10%, we know that we have uh, 10 grams of solute per 100 grams of solution. Right? That's what that means. Parts per hundred percent. Parts per hundred. So what does that mean for the solvent? How much solvent is there? Well, 10 grams of this is solute. Right? So 90 grams is solvent. Okay? This way we know that if we have a sample, if we sample this mixture, and we pull out 10 grams total of the mixture, we know that one gram is solute. That's 10%. So calculate the mass percent here. If you have 5.5 grams of glucose and 78.2 grams of water, Five point five grams of sucrose and seventy eight point two grams of water. Right? But remember, sucrose is part of that total. There you go. So if we calculate it like that, we get six point six percent glucose. That's mass percent, or sometimes we write it. Mass, mass. Just to be sure that we know it's mass here and mass here. Okay. A more commonly used unit for, for solutions is called molarity. And it's, it is equal to a big M. So a number in front of that M means such and such molar, X molar. And, it, and it's calculated by uh, moles of solute per liter of solution. Okay? So if you know the value of molarity, and you pull out, say, 
100 milliliters of the solution, then you can calculate exactly how many moles of solute are in that solution. We set it up like this, molarity equals moles per volume. And of course, we know that the volume has to be in liters. The, the um, utility of this expression is that once you know the molarity of the solution, then uh, you, you know that it doesn't matter what's in the solution as far as this term goes, because a mole is a mole is a mole, right? Well, we know uh, a different mass of, say, sodium chloride will give you different moles than, say, um, I don't know, calcium hydroxide, right? They have different molar mass. But once you determine the number of moles per unit volume, they may have the same molarity because they have the same number of particles, number of molecules in that volume. Okay. <clears throat> so there's the expression. And notice we have this equation. If you know two of them, you can solve for the third one. Right? If we know this one and this one, you calculate molarity. If we know molarity in moles that we want, we know what volume we have to extract in order to get that many moles. Or if we know uh, molarity and volume, we know how many moles we possess. So if we have six moles of um, hydrogen chloride dissolved in two liters of solution, we know that the concentration now is three molar hydrochloric acid. Okay, let's say we have one mole of sugar and 125 milliliters of, of solution. So one mole of sucrose, and how many liters is 125 milliliters? You can do it two different ways. You can use dimensional analysis, go milliliters here, liters here, right? That cancels. So what's the ratio here? Well, a thousand milliliters in a liter. So we divide this by a thousand and we get 0 0.125 liters. Or you can just move the decimal place, one, two, three. There we go. So divide 0.125 into one. And we get eight molar. So this solution is eight molar in sucrose. All right, let me see how we're, how we're clicking here. I think we'll be all right. How about this one? 500 grams of potassium phosphate dissolved in enough water to make 1.5 liters of solution. What's the molarity? In this case, we know the mass of the potassium phosphate, but we don't know the moles. We have to find the moles, and we've learned how to do that. First of all, what's potassium phosphate? You can't determine the molar mass of potassium phosphate unless you know the formula. All right? So we know there's potassium, and we know there's phosphate. This one has a three minus charge, that's a one plus charge. So we need three of these. There's your formula for potassium phosphate. So what's the molar mass of potassium phosphate? Why do I need that? Because I need to change 500, excuse me, 500.0 grams into moles. So grams has to cancel, leave us with moles. Grams per mole, that's molar mass. So, What's the molar mass for potassium? Well, we go to your periodic table. 39.10 times three. Okay. How about phosphorus? 
phosphorus is 30.97. And these are all grams per mole. And then four oxygens. Oxygen is 16. And we add them together. So 39.1 times three, and then 30.97 added to that. And then four times 16 is 64. So we get 212.27 grams per mole. So that goes right here, 212.27. Divided into 500 is 2.35 2 2 moles. Now, the molarity is that many moles, right, in the total volume, which is 1.5 liters. And I get 1.57 molar. Okay. All right. 1.57 molar. So that was a multi-step problem, solving for molarity. Let's look at it from a different angle. For this problem, we have 10 molar sugar solution. We know the molarity. So what volume of that solution do you need to deliver two moles of sugar? So we look at it this way, 10 molar equals moles, oops, we know the moles, don't we? Two moles. We don't know the volume, right? So we've got an equation in one unknown, we can solve it. Move the volume over here. And here we have 10 molar, which means what? Moles per liter. So this cancels. And remember, the denominator of the denominator is the numerator. So this liter comes up here. So 2 divided by 10 is what? All right, it's one fifth. So what is that? 0. Two, let's see, three significant figures, leaders. Okay, just as a point of interest, how many milliliters is that? One, two, three. 200 milliliters. All right. Oh, got another one. Okay, in this case, we're going to consider two different solutions. One is made of sodium hydroxide in water, and the other is made from potassium chloride in water. But we've got 100 grams of each one. And the final solution for each is 250 milliliters. What's the concentration of each one in molarity? So we've got sodium hydroxide. 100 grams and we've got potassium chloride 100 grams okay we need to convert these to moles before we can calculate the concentration correct so each one needs molar mass so what's the molar mass of sodium hydroxide well, let's see, sodium is 23, 
oxygen 16 and hydrogen is 1.01 right? 7 yeah 7 10 40 40.01 Right there. How about potassium chloride? Well, potassium is 39.10. Right? And chlorine is 35.45. But I can do better than that. There we go. So that's five, five, fourteen, seventy-four point five five. Okay. Now we can calculate the number of moles of each one. So 100 divided by 40.01 is, let's see, four significant figures, 2.499 moles of sodium hydroxide. And this one is 100. Divided by 74.55 is 1.341 moles of potassium chloride. Now, what's the molarity of each one? Well, uh, let's do this one. Uh, we can do this one first. Molarity here is 2.499 moles per what volume? What's the final volume? 250 milliliters, which is how many liters? 0 0.2500 liters. And I get, let's see, four significant figures, 9.998 molar. How about this molarity? Well, we get 1.3 or 1 moles of potassium chloride for the same volume. Okay. And I get 5.366 molar. Okay. We have the same mass for each one, but a different molarity. And the reason for that is the difference in molar mass. 100 grams of potassium chloride gives you fewer moles. So you have less molarity. All right, and there's the calculation animated version. All right, we're rounding off there, so that gives us uh, 10 for the sodium hydroxide. And we're probably going to round this one off also. And that gives us 5.37 molarity. Okay. Next problem. You've got two hydrochloric acid solutions, labeled solution A and B. Solution A has a greater concentration than solution B. Which of the following statements are true? Okay. So concentration of A is greater. So the molarity of A is greater than the molarity of B. Okay. So let's say, what would that be? That would be so many moles of A per liter. So many moles of B per liter. Okay, now let's look at our possibilities. Which one of these is true? If you have equal volumes of both solutions, so these are both equal, Solution B must contain more moles than A. That's false. If you have equal volumes, then you will have more of this one. 
because the concentration is greater. So A is false. How about B? If you have equal moles of HCl, right? equal moles of HCl in both solutions, solution B must have a greater volume. Right. If you have equal moles now, because this is a lesser concentration, you need more volume to give you the same number of moles. So B is true. To obtain equal concentrations of both solutions, you must add a certain amount of water to solution B. That's false. It's already more dilute than A. If you add more solvent, you dilute it further. So C is false. How about D? Adding more moles of HCl to both solutions will make them less concentrated. <laughs> no. If you add more solute, you increase their concentration. So this one's false. The only one that's true is B. There you go. Okay. Now, let's go back to that topic where we said if the substance that goes into solution, the solute, is ionic and it does go into solution, then it breaks up into individual ions. What effect does that have on the concentration? Right. Here's our example, 0.25 molar calcium chloride. 0 0.25 molar calcium chloride. And we assume this is aqueous. All right, what does that mean? That means that in one liter of solution, you have one quarter or 0.25 moles of this formula. All right. But this, when it goes into solution, forms calcium two plus ions and two chloride ions. Okay. So now what's the concentration of each of the ions? Well, for every one of these, one of those goes into solution. So it's the same concentration. But for every one of these, you get two of those. So this one is twice the concentration. Okay. All right. <clears throat> So what's the total concentration of ions? Well, if you've got, how many ions do you have here? Three ions go into solution. So for every one of these, you get three times that. So it's 0 0.75 molar in ions. Okay. Or you can add these two together. It works both ways. All right. So now I think I'm going to have to use little Henry Ford. Hmm. Let's see. Yes. Okay. So if we have um, these four solutions. Four hundred milliliters of 0 0.1 molar sodium chloride. Four hundred milliliters of 0 0.1 molar sodium chloride. And the second one is 300 milliliters. Oh, it's four. There we go. Uh, 0 0.1 molar. Calcium chloride, correct? And then iron three chloride, we have 200 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar. 
There we go. And we have 800 milliliters of 0 0.1 molar sucrose. Okay, which one has the greatest number of ions? Well, we can save ourselves some work. Sucrose is molecular. It does not break up into ions, right? So we don't even have to do this one. It doesn't make ions. So we'll focus on this group up here. So, um, how many moles of sodium chloride are produced by this solution? Well, remember, molarity equals moles divided by volume. So, moles equals molarity times volume. Just pull this one over here. So, if we multiply molarity times volume, we should get the number of moles of sodium chloride. Right? So we say uh, 0 0.1 molar times volume in liters, correct? 0 0.4000 liters equals um, 0 0.04. moles of sodium chloride okay how many ions is that well for every one sodium chloride you make two ions right? so we need like this ions so for every one of those you make two of those so the total is 0 0.8000 moles of ions. We'll do the same thing for this one. All right? 0 0.3 liters equals 0, 0.0300 moles of calcium chloride. So what's the ratio here? It's three to one. So it's zero point, oops, excuse me. Did I do that right? One tenth molar. Yes, okay. Just checking myself. Zero nine zero 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 moles. Okay, and one more. Zero point one zero molar times 0 0.2 liters equals 0 0.02 mole of iron three chloride. And the ratio here is four to one, right? One, two, three, four. So four times 0.02 is 0 0.0800 oh. Okay, so the one that produced most is B. And I think it's animated here. There you go. Calcium chloride in this problem produces the most number of ions. Um, all right, so these are steps in, in solving a problem. If you want to follow them, that's fine. The first step is, what's the question? Where are we going? What is the question? What's the problem asking? Then you devise a way to get there then you work the problem. And one thing that's left out here is after you've got an answer, does the answer make sense? If I had um, 400 milliliters of 0.1 molar sodium chloride and I came out with 8,000 moles, would that make sense? No. Wouldn't make sense to me. So be sure that your answer 
keeps you on this planet. Unless you have reason to go to a different planet. All right. All right. The point here is that the greatest number of ions is not necessarily one with the greatest volume or the highest concentration for that matter. You have to work the problem to find the answer. Okay, what is a standard solution? Well, when you prepare a solution, you try to uh, measure out the solute and the solvent um, with the highest accuracy possible. Uh, a standard solution is one in which the concentration is very accurately known. Now, it's never perfect, right? Because every time you make a measurement, there is the potential for error. Error is always present. You try to minimize. A standard solution has the barest minimum of possible error error attached to it. Oh, and this video is going to describe preparing a solution. So let's see, I think I have to click to get it started. Hi, I'm Jared Hyman, an assistant professor of chemistry at Elon University. Today, I'll be taking you through the appropriate technique and procedure for preparing a chemical solution. One of the most important abilities at all levels of chemistry is the preparing of a solution of a specific concentration. First, we'll define some of the terms used in this process. A solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more chemicals. For the simplest solution, a smaller amount of one chemical, called the solute, is placed in a larger amount of a second chemical, known as the solvent. Today, we will be preparing a solution of sodium chloride using a small amount of sodium chloride as our solute added to a larger volume of water, our solvent. Before beginning any experiment, it's important to observe appropriate lab safety procedure and know the hazards of any chemicals you're working with. In any chemical reaction, it's important to keep track of the exact amount of reactants present. And for stoichiometric purposes, we use the term mole to define the amount of a substance. A mole is a counting term, similar to a dozen eggs, where one mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd things. As you can see, this is a really large number. The periodic table uses molar counting as a means of converting to a more experimental term of mass. For example, one mole of carbon atoms has a mass of 12.01 grams. In a compound such as sodium chloride, it's made up of one mole of sodium atoms with a mass of 22.98 grams per mole, along with one mole of chlorine atoms with a mass of 35.45 grams per mole, giving us a total of 58.43 grams per mole of sodium chloride. This means of using mass to determine the amount of a substance is useful for pure chemicals. But in the case of solutions, we now have a mixture of multiple different substances. Therefore, we express amount as a concentration. The most common unit for concentration in chemistry is molarity, abbreviated capital M, which indicates the number of moles of solute dissolved in a certain volume of the total solution. This gives molarity derived units of moles per liter. It is very important to note that this is a volume of solution, not the volume of solvent. Today, we will be preparing 500 milliliters of a 0.25 molar sodium chloride solution. Before beginning, it's important to map out your procedure for preparing this solution. Here, we'll look at the amount of sodium chloride we need in this solution. We know that we want to prepare a 0.25 molar solution, which means that there is 0.25 moles per liter of solution. We also know that we only want 500 milliliters of this solution, or a half liter. If we multiply these two terms together, 
we can see that we will need 0.125 moles of sodium chloride. From earlier, we can remember that there are 58.43 grams per mole of sodium chloride. We can determine that the exact mass that must be measured out is 7.304 grams of sodium chloride. In lab, obtain some sodium chloride and a clean lab scoop and using a balance with some weighing paper, measure out as close to 7.304 grams as possible, marking down your exact mass. Note that if you go over the desired mass, it's never appropriate laboratory procedure to put the excess reagent back into the original container. Always use an additional container to collect the excess. Once you've measured out your solid and recorded the exact mass, Transfer all of the solid to the appropriate sized volumetric flask. Volumetric flasks are made specifically for this purpose and should be used over other less accurate labware, such as beakers, Erlenmeyer flasks, or graduated cylinders. Here, we just transferred our solute to the 500 milliliter volumetric flask. If any solute remains on the weighing paper, use a spatula or a small amount of water to transfer the remaining salt. Next, Add enough water so that the bulb area at the bottom of the flask is approximately half full. This will give you enough room to swirl the liquid, allowing the solute to completely dissolve. Again, it's critical that all of the solute is dissolved prior to filling to the appropriate volume, as different solutes may take up more volume in solution than their undissolved salts. Now that the sodium chloride is completely dissolved, we can fill the rest of the bulb area and some of the neck with water. You should now carefully and slowly add water, our solvent, as it begins to fill the neck. Once you approach the etched or printed line on the neck of the flask, you should add solvent dropwise, monitoring the location of the meniscus. Water, as a polar solvent, tends to cling to the glass walls of a flask. This phenomenon creates what is called a meniscus. The bottom of this curved meniscus should sit directly level with the line on the flask. At this point, there is exactly 500 milliliters of solution with an air of 0.2 milliliters. Different volume flasks have different air values. However, the air on a volumetric flask is much lower than any other type of glassware of similar volume. For example, the volume markings on a beaker or an Erlenmeyer flask are only accurate to plus or minus 5%, meaning if the meniscus were on the 500 milliliter line, it could be anywhere between 475 milliliters and 525 milliliters. On the other hand, using a volumetric flask, we know that the volume is exactly somewhere between 499.8 milliliters and 500.2 milliliters, meaning it's much more accurate. We now must determine the exact concentration of our solution by taking the mass that we measured out and dividing by formula mass for sodium chloride. 58.43 grams per mole, which gives us a total number of moles in our solution of 0.1253 moles. We can then take this number and divide by our volume of 0.5000 liters to give us a total exact concentration of this solution of 0.2501 molar sodium chloride. This value and the contents of the solution should be clearly labeled on the chosen storage container for laboratory safety protocol. You've now learned how to make a solution from a solid. Everything you need to do this demonstration in your lab is available from Carolina. We have experts who can assist you with any of your science demonstration needs. Visit us at carolinachemistry.com to see our complete line of products and kits for chemistry. <clears throat> so, um, to let's look at how this solution is made and postulate or say what ifs about what could possibly go wrong. Where could you introduce error? Okay, you weigh out your sample, just like the like the uh, professor said. You transfer it to the volumetric flask. And why do you use a volumetric flask? Because it is specifically designed to contain 
a an accurately known volume of solution. Then you you add enough solvent to bring it to the mark. And of course, you mix it so that it uh, goes into solution. But here are the things that could go wrong. You could make an error in weighing the sample. You could spill some when you're transferring, right? You don't make what's called a quantitative transfer. Quantitative transfer uh, says that all of the material that was weighed on the balance is transferred into the container. It could be that the you put you uh, miscalculated and the solution that you want exceeds the solubility of the solute in which in which case all of the solute does not go into solution. The other possibility for incomplete dissolution is that you don't wait. You the ideal is to with your flask. You have your solid in the bottom and you add a certain amount of water. Right up maybe here or here. There's the marking. And you mix it until it's completely dissolved. OK, once it's dissolved, then you can add water and bring it to the mark that guarantees that the solute has been dissolved. That won't introduce this particular error. You could um, miss the mark or instead of instead of doing it correctly, maybe your meniscus is like that. You've got the top of your meniscus at the mark when it should be the bottom of the meniscus. All volumetric glassware is calibrated to be read with the liquid at the bottom of the meniscus. All right. Now, here's another problem. Suppose and think back to our earlier slide. Did the solution get hot? when you made it or did it get cold? If it got cold, then you bring it to the mark and it's still cold. So what's it gonna do when it comes to room temperature? It heats up, it's going to expand and then it will be above the mark and you'll have too much liquid in there for that temperature. So what we typically do is once we've got it mixed, we bring it up into the neck here and feel, is it hot, is it cold? Or you could even measure the temperature. So if the temperature is significantly different than room temperature, then you wait. You just set it on your bench top and wait for it to equilibrate to the temperature, then bring it to the mark. If it's hot, if it gets hot, then you can bring it to the mark, and then as it cools down, it will decrease volume. And once it reaches the um, room temperature, you can add a little more volume to bring it to the mark. But this temperature phenomenon is characteristic of molarity determinations, right? Because molarity is moles per volume. There's the culprit. When you're basing your concentration on volume, temperature is significant. A significant factor. I can't think of anything else that's that's really important right now, but maybe you can think about it, research it. Okay. <clears throat> Here's another problem. Uh, story time. I used to work in. Um, uh, soil science and um, occasionally I would um, work in the soil testing laboratory and in that laboratory what we wanted to know was um, what I usually wanted to know was what's the fertility level of your soil so the farmer goes out and takes a sample 
brings it back to you or the county agent, the county agent sends it to, to us to be analyzed. We want to know um, certain things about that soil. So sometimes uh, we would get that knowledge by extracting the soil with a solution of a known concentration of, say, a salt or an acid or some other component. And the laboratory would do hundreds of those a day. So you have two choices. You can come in real early in the morning, like you're making donuts, and make up enough solution for the day, right, to the specified concentration. It'll take a while to do that because you have to wait for your components, the solutes, to go into solution and come to room temperature and dilute to the volume. Or you could make up a more concentrated stock solution with the proper ratio of solutes. It's a higher concentration. And then when you get ready to run the day samples, you take a portion of that and dilute it to a known volume. You have, you have a known amount of each of the solutes and you increase the solvent so you dilute it down to a working solution. Okay, here's how that works. So you have the concentrated solution over here, and it has a molarity, a concentrated molarity. And you have a volumetric flask over here. Right there. This is going to contain your diluted solution. This is our stock solution. This is our working solution. So if you bring a certain volume here, right, volume of the concentrated, and the total volume here is volume of the dilute. So if you take a volume out of here, what does that tell you about the number of moles of the solute? We know that MC times VC equals moles of the solute, right, from the concentrated side. Well, this goes over here. That number of moles goes over here and now becomes part of this expression. Oops. My mistake. Okay, so when you transfer this liquid over here, what is it that does not change? The thing that does not change is the number of moles of solute. You bring a volume over here, you've got a sum of moles here. The moles here is the same as the moles here. So if this number of moles is equal to that number of moles, And this side is equal to this, then it has to be equal to that. Correct? So now, if you know the concentrated molarity and you know the molarity that you want and the volume of the container, then you can calculate the unknown amount. The volume here that you need to take out and dilute to that volume, and that will give you the exact molar concentration that you need for the day's work. And the reason this works is because moles from the concentrated side equals moles on the diluted side. Sometimes we express that as M1V1 equals M2V2 or MCVC equals MDVD. The important thing to do when you're solving this problem is get these numbers in the right place. Right? So that's why when I read a word problem and it's going to be a dilution problem, I set up a chart.
and I say, and I go into the problem and I say, where does this go? Something goes here, something goes here, something goes here, solve for this one. Then I can put the numbers in the correct position in that formula and get the right answer. If I put the numbers in the wrong place, obviously I got the wrong answer. All right. Oh, we have another demonstration for dilution. I think it's the same guy. Hi, I'm Jared Hyman, an assistant professor of chemistry at Elon University. Today I'll be taking you through the appropriate procedure and technique for diluting a solution. A common laboratory technique is preparing a more dilute solution from a concentrated stock solution. In this case, we are going to prepare a 0 0.250 liter solution of 0 0.01 molar. We know our stock solution has a concentration of 0 0.250 molar. The first thing we need to do is determine the exact number of moles in our dilute solution. We know our concentration needs to be 0 0.01 molar or 0 0.01 moles per liter. Since we know our number of moles per liter and we know the volume we need, we can calculate that we need exactly 0 0.0025 moles of sodium chloride. Knowing our stock solution contains 0.25 moles per liter, we can take the number of moles needed in our dilute solution and divide by the concentration of our stock solution to calculate the exact number of milliliters that must be transferred into our new solution. In this case, 0 0.01 liters of sodium chloride solution or 10 milliliters. This is the stock solution of sodium chloride that we will be diluting. Make sure to pour the stock solution into another container before inserting the pipette into the solution. This is because you do not want to contaminate your stock solution. In this case, I'm using an Erlenmeyer flask. Notice that I have clearly labeled the flasks to adhere to proper laboratory safety protocol. To prepare our dilute solution, we will take a 10 milliliter aliquot of our stock solution using a 10 milliliter volumetric pipette. To use the pipette, place the pipette in the liquid to be collected. Squeeze the pipette bulb and allow the liquid to rise up the pipette. You should allow the liquid to pass the line marked on the pipette, but before the bulb. Remove the bulb and place your other thumb over the end creating a seal and slowly release just the corner of your thumb allowing the liquid to exit so that the meniscus is directly on the line marked on the pipette. This takes some practice and you may need to use the bulb to pull more liquid into the pipette again. Never pipette by mouth. Once you have the exact amount of liquid required in the pipette, hold your thumb firmly over the end and transfer the pipette to a new volumetric flask, in this case a clean 250 milliliter volumetric flask. Allow all of the liquid to flow out of the pipette. Do not use the bulb to force the liquid out, as pipettes are designed to deliver the exact amount of liquid, and there may be a small amount of liquid remaining at the end. Remove the pipette and follow the same procedure as before, filling the volumetric flask with solvent, again monitoring the meniscus until the exact volume is reached. You've now learned how to prepare a dilute solution from a stock solution. To see how to prepare a stock solution, you can view our solution preparation video at carolina.com slash video. Everything you need to perform this technique in your lab is available from Carolina. Visit us at carolinachemistry.com to see our complete line of products and kits for chemistry. All right. <clears throat> so that was a pretty good video. He did make some mistakes though. When you, uh, when you bring your pipette, when you bring your pipette out of the solution, there might be a little bubble, little things here. There's your line and you've got solution up here. There's your line. Uh, and there's 
uh, you got things clinging to the end of your glassware. That shouldn't happen in most cases if your glassware is clean, but some solutions are, are stubborn. So what you do is you take a chem wipe, which is specially designed tissue that uh, is lint free. And you just drag it down the tip and remove those drops. Then you've got your thumb here over the end and you allow it to drop to right here on that mark right there. And then you may have a drop clean to the end so you just touch it to the inside of the beaker and get rid of that drop. Then you transfer it into your volumetric flask. And when you do that, transfer it here, you let it drain under gravity. This tip is made small enough so that the drain slowly, and that gives time enough for any liquid clinging to the inside of the glass to drain down. It's precisely calibrated so that uh, it will drain slow enough, slowly enough, so that um, you won't have any clinging to the inside of the glassware. But you may also have another drop on the tip. So what you do is you just touch that drop to the inside of your volumetric glassware, and that has delivered exactly the volume that the pipette is designed to deliver. And then you add your solid. Usually, at this point, um, the stock solution and adding more solvent will not change its temperature. Temperature change occurs when you make the stock solution. But when you make a diluted solution, you can usually go right ahead and dilute to the mark. Okay, so that's how you make a dilute solution from a stock. Um, let's see. Okay, so <laughs> this is an extra slide that describes the same process. Okay, we got about 15 minutes and I think I'm, I'm running out of time. So I'm gonna go through this one really quick. If you have a 0.5 molar solution of sodium chloride, in an open beaker on the lab bench, which of the following would decrease the concentration of the salt? Add water to the solution? Yeah, water's the solvent. If you add more solvent, you decrease the concentration of the solute. So A, yeah, A is a decrease. Pour some of the solution down the sink. <laughs> what does that do? That uh, reduces the volume in the beaker but it reduces the solvent and the solute at the same rate. So there's no change. Add more sodium chloride. If you add more solute, you increase its concentration, right? So that's not decreased. Oh, uh, let the solution sit out on the open air for a couple of days. Assuming that the solute is non-volatile and the only volatile component is the solvent, then you would increase the concentration of the solute. At least two of the above ways could decrease. No, only one. Only one decreases the concentration in this selection, and that is add more solvent. What's the minimum volume of two molar sodium hydroxide solution needed to make 150 milliliters of 0.8 molar sodium hydroxide solution? Okay, so here's my table. Here's the concentration, oops, the concentrated here, the dilute, the concentrated volume, the dilute molarity, and the dilute volume. Okay, so let's put the values in here where they're supposed to go. The concentrated solution is two molar sodium hydroxide. Okay. The minimum volume of that is unknown. 
we're going to make 150 milliliters and the concentration needs to be 0 0.800 molar okay now we have everything properly arranged we can put them in our formula so this one times that one equals this one yeah this one times this one okay so what what would appear to be wrong with this picture that volume is not liters and it doesn't need to be because this volume will be the same units as that volume in this ratio setup these volumes would cancel right whether they're liters uh, milliliters deciliters gallons it doesn't matter the units will be the same so we can leave it exactly as it is and we don't have to convert to liters when we use the dilution formula okay so Here's the setup, and the answer is 60 milliliters. Notice that the value comes out in the same units as this one. So 60 milliliters of two molar sodium hydroxide diluted to a final volume of 150 milliliters will give you a 0 0.8 molar solution concentrated, a solution concentration of sodium hydroxide. Okay, now that we know how to deal with solutions, we can use this knowledge in a stoichiometric problem. In other words, a balanced chemical equation, and we can use solutions in this uh, reaction to determine the outcome. Remember when I talked about stoichiometry before, when you have a balanced equation and you have masses of reactants, you can't go anywhere in that equation to the products or maybe to another reactant unless you have moles. You must have moles. And the way we did it before was to convert mass to moles using molar mass of the reactants or the products. Right? Now we've got solutions and we have another formula, right? Moles equals molarity times volume. So if we have a reactant that's given to us a certain molarity and a certain volume, then we can calculate how many moles is there and we can move in our equation. That's where we're headed. So we write the balanced equation, we calculate the number of moles, we determine which reactant is limiting if that's the case, right? If we have two exact amounts, given amounts of reactants, say, we wanna find out which one is limiting, we know how to do that. And then calculate the number of moles of reactant or product that's required and convert them uh, back to grams or uh, molarity in the solution, whatever the case, Whatever the question asks, you can do it. All right, here's an example. All right. In this example, we're given 10 milliliters of 0.3 molar sodium phosphate reacts with 20 milliliters of lead to nitrate. So we've got sodium phosphate. All right, a three minus and one plus, so we have three here, and this is an aqueous solution, all right? Gonna react with what? Uh, lead to nitrate. So that's a two plus, and nitrate is one minus, so we need 
two of these. All right now we have our formulas. Um, there must be more to the problem. What precipitate will form? Okay, remember how we did that in the previous chapter? We said this cation associates with that anion. Right? Plus one minus one. That's it. So we look it up. Is this one soluble? Right? Look it up in your chart. Right? With the uh, cations across the top, anions down the left hand side, match them up and look for the clear square or the grayed out square. This one is soluble. The other possibility is phosphate and lead. So lead, two plus, and phosphate, three minus. Best way to do this one is cross multiply. So bring the three over here and the two over there. And we look this one up in our chart and find out that this one is not soluble. In other words, the forces holding these ions together is stronger than the forces trying to pull them apart. So they remain together and fall out of solution. That's the precipitate. Okay, come on, there we go. What precipitate forms, and then we determine how much of the precipitate will form. All right. So there we've determined aqueous solutions combine to produce aqueous sodium nitrate, which means what? It means sodium ions are still floating around, nitrate ions are still floating around. Okay. But lead and phosphate form our solid. There we go. What's the limiting reactant? Well, now we need some more details. 10 milliliters of 0.3 molar, 10 milliliters of 0 0.3 molar, and 20 milliliters of 0 0.2 molar. There we go. Those two are put together. So remember, let's see, I've got too many, <coughs> I got too many zeros in here. How about the volumes? Yeah, the volumes are okay. When you have known amounts of reactants, one of them is more than likely going to be limiting. So in order to move anywhere in this equation, we need to know the number of moles. So if we multiply, Right? Moles equals molarity times volume. So if we multiply these together, we get um, 0.3 times 10 is 3.00 millimoles. Okay, I threw another term at you. When you multiply molarity times milliliters, you get millimoles. Now, can I do that? Well, sure. I'll prove it to you. If we have um, three millimoles, right, we're going to calculate molarity. If we have three millimoles and it's in 10 milliliters, like that, notice. What's milli? Milli is 10 to the minus three. 10 to the minus three. Well, they cancel. So that's the same thing as saying three moles per 10 liters. All right? So 
we can use millimoles. And it's more convenient, actually, to use millimoles at this point. All right, so over here now we have um, four millimoles. Okay. So um, one thing we forgot to do, correct? We forgot to balance the equation. Um, if we do the budget method, uh, I don't have time to do it right now, so I'm going to use the values that were given there. We have three here, and six there, and one there. And you can verify that's balanced. Okay, now that we have this determined, we can find out how much product will be produced. Right? So if we have three millimoles of sodium phosphate, we want to convert that to lead to phosphate. Right? What's the ratio? One of these, two of those. So it's one half, 1 1.50 millimoles of lead to phosphate can be produced from this much sodium phosphate. How about this? We want to convert this here to this one. Right, what's the ratio? Well, it's one again, but this one's three. So it's three into four. Well, let's see, three, three goes into four one time, and then three goes into 10 three times, and then three times. So we round it off to 1.33 millimoles. Okay, so which one is limiting? The one that produces the least amount of product. This one. This one is limiting. That makes this one excess. So which one are we going to use? We're going to use this one. 1.33 millimoles of that compound is how many grams? Okay. This slide works it out using moles. That's fine. That, that works too. We had to determine which one was limiting. There we go. So now that we know the limiting one, here, okay, I've gone too far. <laughs> now that we know the limiting one, we can't use millimoles anymore. We need moles. So take this one right here and convert it to 10 to the minus three, right? So that means we have 1.33 times 10 to the minus three moles of lead to phosphate. Okay, now we want to convert that to mass. We need the molar mass of lead to phosphate, and it's already calculated here, so we don't have to waste time. 811.54. grams per mole. And if we multiply those out, we get 1.08 grams of this compound. Okay. Now we know how much should be produced. Is that amount going to be produced? Probably not. We'll lose some somewhere. Um, more than likely, there'll be um, uh, a yield factor, percentage yield factor. But that's the ideal, that's the 100% recovery value. Okay. So this same problem asks another question. 
What is the concentration of nitrate ions left in solution after the reaction is complete? Well, the nitrates are here, and they're still in solution over here, right? They didn't, they didn't drop out of solution. So we can calculate the nitrate concentration if we know what it is here, right? This is the number of millimoles that went in. Right? This is the number of millimoles of this compound. How many millimoles of nitrate are there? Well, there are four times two, right? For every one, you get two nitrates. So we have eight millimoles of nitrate. Okay? That's how much we have left over here. What's the volume? The volume is 10 plus 20 milliliters. Right? So eight millimoles divided by 10 plus 20 or 30. And millimoles divided by milliliters is the concentration. Right? So we just need to go to the next slide. Here we go. Okay, a lot of repetition here. Okay, there's the explanation for how many moles of nitrate are in solution. And then we had to divide that by the volume, and we get 0 0.27 molar nitrate. Still in aqueous solution. Okay. I'm going to throw another curve at us. What's the concentration of phosphate? Well, notice phosphate came from the excess reactant, right? So that means we didn't use all of the phosphate up. There's some left over. All right. How much did we start with? Well, three millimoles of this is how many millimoles of that? Three millimoles of sodium phosphate uh, gives us three millimoles of phosphate. Right, because it's one to one. For each one of these, you get one of those. Okay, now how much was used? 2.66. Right, so we have uh, 4, 3, 0 0.34. Now we divide this by the total volume, milliliters, 0.34 divided by 30. is 0. Point, let's see well it's 1.13 times 10 minus 2 1.13 times 10 to the minus 2 molar okay here we go all right, we're approaching this from the net ionic equation idea, which is fine. Either way works. So there we have that many moles used up in the reaction, right? 2.66 millimoles, which is 0 0.027 uh, moles, 0 0.0027. And we started out with 0 0.003. So subtract the two and then divide by the volume. Okay. So we rounded it off to 0 0.01. 0 0.01 molar. That's the concentration of phosphate that was not used. It's now still in solution. All right. So um, 
over time, but we need this one last topic. Okay, a neutralization reaction. That's where we react an acid with a base. It's just that simple. And for our purposes, um, an acid has hydrogen and something else. It could have one hydrogen, it could have two, it could have three. And a base is going to be something with a hydroxyl, usually. Most commonly, it's that way. And the reaction then gives you the combination of this cation and this anion, which is called a salt, plus water, because you combine OH with H, and you get water. That's a neutralization reaction. So the overall reaction, the net ionic reaction, this is all in solution. Usually. Now, sometimes this one drops out as a solid. Not every time, but sometimes it does. And leaves us with water. So the net ionic is this one. That one yields that one. That's the net ionic equation for an acid base reaction. So here we have, we're going to titrate. What do we mean by titrate? Titrate, titration is a method that is not just acid base, but in our case, it's an acid base titration where you add, um, you have a solution of unknown concentration. You have a solution of unknown concentration here, and you have a method of delivery of something else. So let's just say for argument's sake, let's say this is the acid, and the concentration is question. So you have a known volume, right? A known volume of your acid. And then you have in this device called a burette which is marked off in units of volume. And in this one, you have a base with known concentration. And you deliver, you deliver a volume, right? A volume of base. That way, molarity times volume is the moles, the moles of the base. And that's equal to the moles of the acid when you reach the point of equivalence where you have exactly the same amount of moles of acid and base. And that way we can calculate molarity of acid, volume of acid equals molarity of base, volume of base. Right, so we can calculate our unknown here because we know how much was delivered. We know the concentration first and we know the volume of the acid that we put in that container. That's how we do an acid-base titration. Now, how do we know when the moles of acid equals the moles of base exactly? We use a color indicator. Something down here that will change color when it goes from acid conditions to base conditions. And that tells us when we've reached the end point. Now, the problem, <laughs> the problem with this is, this only works, molarity, molarity. This only works when you have, ah, uh, when your acid is monohydrogen and your base is monohydroxyl, or when they're both um, 
two here and two here. Otherwise, what you have to do is use the, the balanced equation. So if we're titrating sulfuric acid with sodium hydroxide, how many moles of sodium hydroxide would be required to react with one liter of 0.5 molar sulfuric acid? Well, one liter of 0.5 mol, uh, sulfuric acid produces how much, how many moles of sulfuric acid is that? Well, it's one liter volume times molarity. That would be equal to 0 0.5 moles of sulfuric acid. Okay? But if we use our coefficients, we convert. This means that we need um, one mole of sodium hydroxide. Right? Because there's one here and there are two there. So it takes twice as much sodium hydroxide as it does sulfuric acid to neutralize it. Okay. Now, what chemists have done over the years is is do an end run around this expression. And they've created a concentration unit based upon molarity, but taking into account the number of hydrogens or hydroxyls that are present in the molecule. And this value is called normality. Okay, so we speak in terms of equivalence. That's the amount of acid that furnishes one mole of protons, one mole of hydrogen ions. So if we have um, one mole of HCl, how many equivalents is that? That's equal to one equivalent. Right? Like that, one equivalent. But if we have one mole of H2SO4, that's two equivalents of hydrogen ions. See? Or if we have uh, phosphoric acid, one mole of phosphoric acid equals three equivalents of hydrogen ions. Similarly, for base, if we have uh, one mole of sodium hydroxide, we have one equivalent of hydroxyls. Or if we have one mole of calcium hydroxide, we have two equivalents of hydroxide. Okay? Now, what's the equivalent weight? Well, the equivalent weight is kind of like the molar mass, except the molar, the equivalent weight of this one is the same as the molar mass. Right? So um, the equivalent weight, EW, equals equivalent weight. The equivalent weight of this one equals the molar mass. They're exactly the same because it produces one and one. Whereas this one, the equivalent weight is equal to molecular weight divided by two because it only takes as half as much of this one to produce a single equivalent. And for this one, the equivalent weight would be equal to the molecular weight divided by three. See, that's what that means. Okay. Uh, that doesn't help much. This does. 
molar mass of hydrogen chloride is 36.5. The equivalent weight is the same. Nitric acid, same, same, because one hydrogen. Sulfuric acid, though, is 98 molar mass grams, uh, grams per mole, but half of that is the equivalent weight. Sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, they're equivalent. Right, the equivalent weight is the same as the molar mass. So when we calculate normality, normality equals the number of equivalents per liter. That's what normality means. So normality times volume equals the number of equivalents. So if we have an, uh, if we have established the normality of our sulfuric acid and the normality of our sodium hydroxide, then the formula becomes normality of acid times volume of acid equals normality of base times volume of base. Now that we've taken those um, variables, number of hydrogen or hydroxyl, we've taken that out and incorporated it into the value. This expression works for any acid base titration. So let's see if we understand. If barium hydroxide is used as a base, how many equivalents of barium hydroxide are there in four moles of barium hydroxide? There should be eight, right? Four moles of that molecule gives you twice as many equivalents of hydroxide. Okay. All right. That's as far as we need to go. And um, review document. Um, PowerPoint slides and worked problems are all in Brightspace. Next time we meet, we'll do a review over this material using the review document.